Good afternoon and Happy New Year. Welcome to the Florida chapter of the American Planning Association's Lunch and Learn webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Tools to Assess Impacts from Coastal Flooding and Sea Level Rise. This is the second in a series of webinars hosted by the APA Florida chapter and developed by the Emerging Topics Committee. My name is Lindsay Stevens and I'm the chair of the Emerging Topics Committee. And before we get started, I just want to take a minute to thank the members of the Emerging Topics Committee who have been working really hard over the past year to engage APA Florida's membership and others to identify critical issues that will impact the planning profession in Florida and, and beyond over the next one to two decades. The Emerging Topics Committee is working to locate resources and needed initiatives that APA Florida membership and the planning community beyond Florida can access and utilize in their work. Before I introduce today's topic and presenters, I have just a few housekeeping issues to cover. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the APA Florida website on the Emerging Topics page and this is a members only benefit. So if you're a member of APA Florida, you'll be able to access this webinar uh, in the future. And it's typically posted within a, just a few days um, after today's webinar. This webinar has been approved for one hour of CM credit. So be sure to um, get your CM credits. They're very important. And your invitation to join the webinar today included the information that you'll need for obtaining credit from APA. We welcome your questions today. You're currently on mute, so please type your questions in the chat box. To do this, just simply click your chat box, which is on the side or the bottom of your screen, probably the right-hand side. There's an orange button that you can use to open up the control panel and um, go under the chat um, section. Just type your question in and we'll be happy to pass your question on to the presenter. Questions will be answered at the end of each speaker's presentation. We've got three tools we're covering today and we will um, take questions specific to each tool um, after each tool is discussed. There are also some handouts for this webinar and they're available to you right now. On the GoToMeeting menu bar, click on the orange and white button and you'll see a section titled Handouts. Click on it and the handout should be easy for you guys to just click and pull down and access. We're also going to be polling you during the presentations today. So please participate when the GoToMeeting um, software prompts you. Today's webinar will cover three tools, like I said previously, available for communities to use to assess impacts from coastal flooding or sea level rise. Today we're going to cover the sea level rise viewer the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper, and Sea Level Scenario Sketch Planning Tool. We're pleased to have two presenters today to cover these materials, and these folks will explain these tools and how they may be really useful for you in your practice. The first presenter is Heidi Stiller. Heidi has a background in public policy, coastal management, and sociology. She's been with NOAA since 2001 and is focused on the Gulf of Mexico and Southeast regions and is currently based in St. Petersburg, Florida. Before joining NOAA, Ms. Stiller worked for the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management and spent three years at the Florida Coastal Management Program. In recent years, NOAA has had a growing focus on the topic of resilience, working to identify and promote activities that enhance the resilience of the built, natural, and social environments of coastal communities. Ms. Stiller has been involved in efforts to identify resilience factors and to provide data and tools to help communities address and communicate coastal inundation risks. Land use planning that incorporates hazard mitigation, climate adaptation, and natural resource sustainability is a core focus of Ms. Stiller's work. Our second presenter is Crystal Goodison. Crystal is the Associate Director of the University of Florida's Geoplan Center, which is a Geographic Information Systems Research Center in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. The Geoplan Center works with state, federal, and other agencies to provide mapping data, analysis, and expertise to address environmental, urban planning, and transportation issues. Crystal specializes in project management, enterprise, geospatial database design and administration, and developing decision support tools for environmental and transportation planning. 
She holds a BA in Geography and a Master's in Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Florida. So without further ado, I'm going to um, turn this webinar over to Heidi Stiller to discuss the first tool. Take it away, Heidi. All right. I think I am taking control right now. You should be able to see my screen now. Is it showing up? It is showing up here in Tallahassee. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks very much for that introduction. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share a couple of mapping and visualization tools um, that I think can really help communities plan for both current and future flooding hazards. Um, this year, Hermine and, and Matthew reminded us about the significant flooding impacts that hurricanes can have on Florida, but there's also a growing amount of sunny day flooding that's happening in Florida, particularly in South Florida, as sea levels rise. So I hope the tools that I'll demo today can be of use when you're working on understanding and addressing these flooding challenges. Just before I, I dive in, a, a quick note about my office. Within NOAA, the Office for Coastal Management works with a broad base of coastal decision makers to ensure healthy coastal ecosystems, resilient coastal communities, and vibrant and sustainable coastal economies. Most of our staff are based in Charleston, South Carolina and Silver Spring, Maryland, but we also have really prioritized getting staff out on the ground to understand needs and deliver products and services. And as part of that regional effort, um, I'm part of a Gulf of Mexico staff of eight and I'm based in St. Petersburg, Florida. So today, I'll start out with just a very brief introduction to the Digital Coast, which refers to both a partnership between NOAA and other organizations that are active in coastal management, and it also refers to a one-stop shop website where partners serve up coastal data along with context such as tools, trainings, and examples of applications. After that, I'll just dive into two different demos um, of our two of our most used tools. The first one is the Sea Level Rise Viewer, and the second is the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper. Both of these tools help users visualize coastal flooding hazards and the impacts of those hazards. Local government users have already applied these tools both for planning efforts, such as conducting vulnerability assessments, and for outreach efforts to help others understand current and future risk. Um, and just a, a personal anecdote, you know, I have applied these tools myself um, and I actually just purchased a, a new home here in St. Pete and I used the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper to create a map that I could give to my realtor to show areas that aren't subject to current or future flood risk. Um, so some of these tools can be used at the, the individual level as well. So the Digital Coast Partnership um, is a group of national organizations that care about coastal issues and serve coastal decision maker members and constituents. APA is one of the founding partners and 2017 actually marks the 10 year anniversary of the Digital Coast effort. The whole idea is to serve a, a wide variety of coastal decision makers by providing data and coastal communities, data about coastal communities and coastal resources, along with tools and training and case studies. Um, from the very beginning, the idea with Digital Coast was to be more than data to really help users actually apply the information to planning and management activities. Together with my office, the partners have helped shape the Digital Coast, identifying and contributing resources that will be of use to their members. So in this slide, I have a, a link to the, the Digital Coast. You can also just Google Digital Coast and you'll find it quickly. Um, as I said, today I'll demo two of the many tools that are available on Digital Coast, but I do urge you to explore other tools, data sets, trainings, and case studies that may be helpful. There's information related to topics such as the coastal and ocean economy, green infrastructure, aquaculture and ocean energy siting, and a range of other coastal issues. 
As you might imagine, resilience to coastal flooding hazards, including sea level rise, has been a growing area of emphasis for us on the digital coast as communities grapple with more frequent and severe coastal flooding. The two tools I'll show today were developed to help visualize and quantify the impacts of existing and future coastal inundation. The first focuses specifically on sea level rise, and then the second shows a variety of flooding hazards, including storm surge, FEMA flood zones, and shallow coastal flooding that occurs during extreme high tides. I'll do live demos of both tools um, and take a few minutes for questions um, after each of those before turning it over to Crystal. All right, so I want don't worry about trying to write down the URLs. The handout that Lindsay mentioned at the beginning that you can download has um, just a basic overview of the two tools and there are the URLs for both of the tools there. So don't worry about trying to get those down. I'm going to exit out of my PowerPoint now and head over to show the tools live. All right, so the first tool that I'm going to demo is our Sea Level Rise viewer. And whenever you get to one of our tools on Digital Coast, there'll be some introductory information. Um, in many cases, there's a quick little demo. For this tool, there is an overview video. Um, you can access some frequently asked questions and find out about the, the methods behind the tool and all those good things. So the first thing I'll do is I'll launch our tool. And when you launch the tool, there's a, a disclaimer that just reminds you that this is national level elevation data and is, is really useful for screening level purposes. But if you get to the if you're citing a hospital or something, you'll obviously want to go down on the ground and, and get survey level data. So it starts you out um, at the national level, because this tool is available now nationally. But the first thing that we'll want to do is zoom into Florida. So I have to minimize my webinar panel. There we go. And I'm going to zoom in to Florida. All right. And then once you've selected the state, you can zoom in even further. For the first tool today, I'm going to focus on the Franklin and Gulf counties area of Florida. Um, and then for the second tool, I'll focus in on Pinellas. Um, and these are just sort of personal choices because I, I used to live um, in Franklin County and now I live in Pinellas, so I know the locations well. So you can zoom in um, quite far with these tools. I'm going to stay a little bit zoomed out just so you can see um, some of the marsh impacts as we go along here. So what you're looking at now is the Apalachicola area. That's where my mouse is. Uh, this is St. George Island out here. Uh, this is East Point over here for those that are familiar with this part of Florida. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this little picture icon. We have pictures for locations all around Florida that just show locations or landmarks that people are likely to recognize. So in this case, this is the waterfront area in downtown Apalachicola. Those of you who've been there will definitely recognize it. All right, let's zoom in just a little bit. So when you start out in the tool, this is showing you the current sea level, and this is mean higher high water. And so that means that during any one day, if you have multiple tide cycles during the day, this shows you the higher of those high water events. Um, so this is sort of as high as the water will go right now at our current sea level. And then what this tool allows you to do is visualize what one to six feet of additional sea level rise would mean in terms of where the water will go. The slider bar up here on the upper left is how you add additional sea level. And I'll just move it one bar to the right here. And so this shows a foot of additional sea level in the Franklin County Apalachicola area. And as you'll notice, this area of marsh up here has extensive inundation, even with just one foot of sea level rise. Out on St. George Island, we see a little bit of inundation happening on the back of the barrier island. Um, and that's sort of one of the important things about sea level rise is that often it, it'll rise in the back where the area is lower lying, even though we might think about it coming from the seaward side of an island. Down here in our picture, there's no flooding in, in downtown Apalachicola with one foot of sea level rise. So then we can move up 
to a little bit more. Here's two feet of inundation. And again, you're just seeing more flooding going on um, in some of these coastal low-lying areas. And again, out on the barrier island, you've got more flooding on the, the back bay side. Still no flooding in downtown. And so I'm going to go ahead and bump it up to four feet. So that's three, and here's four. And this is the first time that you see that water would be coming up over the waterfront in Apalachicola um, and starting to head into downtown. So this is four feet of sea level rise. And then, of course, if we bump it all the way up to six feet, um, you see that the cars would be inundated um, in downtown there. And you can see that there's extensive areas of, of marsh that have been completely inundated. Um, and really large portions of St. George Island have also been inundated at that point. So that's really just a basic overview of the sort of the main function of the viewer. It just shows you that, that one to six feet of sea level rise. I do want to mention a couple of the other layers that we have available in this tool. Um, this layer that I've just pulled up is our marsh layer. And what this does is that it shows you the different types of habitats that you have right now, from brackish transitional marsh to your freshwater forested wetland to upland, um, so you can get a feel for the different habitats. And then just as before, if you move the slider bar to show increasing amounts of sea level rise, it shows you how those habitats are likely to transition. And so you might have you know, less upland area as water, gets in, water comes up in there. Um, and some of your freshwater wetlands will become uh, brackish and then saltwater marsh. So that's just another um, layer of the tool that you can use. There's also um, a layer for vulnerability. This is based on the Social Vulnerability Index, which is a product of the University of South Carolina. Um, and the university put together an index that looks at factors such as age and income um, to think about areas that are more or less vulnerable. Overlaying that information with sea level rise can help think about those areas that might need a little bit more help um, adapting or addressing flood risk. I've zoomed back out here just so you can get a feel for the social vulnerability data. This is presented at the census block level. Got a little bit of a data lag. Here we go. All right, so you can see areas that are more and less vulnerable. And if you overlay that with your sea level rise information, um, that just helps you think about places that might need some extra assistance. And the final layer in here is a flood frequency layer. I'm going to zoom us back into our Apalachicola area. And what this does is it shows us right now the areas that will experience shallow coastal flooding when we have an extreme high tide event, um, such as a king tide. And then if you go in and you click on the tide gauge, this is the tide gauge for Apalachicola, it pops up a little graph that tells you right now how often we have these um, shallow coastal flooding events and how long they last. And as you can see right now, they're very rare um, and they don't last very long. But this graph shows that if we had a half a meter of sea level rise, all of a sudden we'd have a lot more of those shallow coastal flooding events. They'd be almost daily. Um, and they would also last for a longer period of time. And then at a meter of sea level rise, um, the number of events goes down. That's just because you'd have continuous um, flooding in those, those shallow coastal areas. So that's a final feature of the tool. I will say that I think the most frequently used piece of this tool is the, the front layer that just shows um, basic different amounts of sea level for an area. You can zoom in pretty close. For those of you familiar with Apalachicola, you can get a feel for that you can get close enough to start to identify streets and, and specific locations. And this is probably the, the piece that people use the most. Um, it's used a lot in outreach efforts just to help raise awareness about future flood risk. All right, and so that is it for the Sea Level Rise viewer. And so I am going to ask Lindsay if there are questions. Um, and maybe we'll also do our poll first poll question.
We do not have any questions. Um, okay. Hopefully the poll just went out. All right, I see the poll there. And the results will just pop up automatically, right? The results are um, popping up automatically, yes. Okay, great. And we've got just about a, a, a few more uh, responses. We have about 80% of the folks have voted. If you could go ahead and lock your answer in, that would be great because we're just about to close the poll. Okay. Okay, so for um, this poll, 25% of, we had an 87% response rate, 25% of um, the webinar attendees said they definitely plan to use this tool. 24% are likely to use, 45% may use the tool in the future, 4% say they're unlikely to use, and 1% say they've already used the tool. So thank you for your response. This is very helpful. Okay, thank you so much. It's really useful for us to get a feel for who's already using the tool and, and if you think it does have application. So thank you so much for taking a minute to do that. Um, and if you do have questions about this as we go along, feel free to, to chat those and, and we can get to them after the other tool. The second tool that I wanna show today is the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper. Um, and this tool is designed to be an easy to use, non-technical tool that can help communities visualize their exposure to coastal flood hazards by showing maps where people, places, and natural resources are exposed to flooding. It's designed to help local planners start conversations about their community's flood issues and potential solutions, um, such as green infrastructure, by selecting and saving maps that can be printed and brought to community planning meetings or added to presentations or pulled up live during a planning meeting. Um, this is a tool that's currently available for the East Coast and Gulf of Mexico, um, and it's gotten a really good response. I think the fact that the maps that you make can be easily shared with others is something that makes this one of our most popular tools. Um, just as with the Sea Level Rise viewer, um, when you navigate to here in the digital coast, um, there's um, some tutorial information um, and background that you can access. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the second tool. Um, and the first thing we'll do is we'll say that we want to start collecting maps. It's got one of the same disclaimers letting you know that this is nationally available data. Um, and so the this tool serves up flood hazards, so not just sea level rise, but also storm surge, um, flood insurance rate map, um, flooding areas, and shallow coastal flooding information. So it, it serves up a variety of flood hazards, and then it gives you the ability to overlay that information with different aspects of community exposure. So you can think about societal exposure, how people will be exposed, infrastructure exposure, um, how critical infrastructure in your area might be impacted, um, and then ecosystem exposure, uh, what might be at risk, but also how might ecosystems help protect from, from flooding hazards as well. So if you're just starting with the tool, we always recommend that you start out just thinking about the flood hazards and getting sort of a feel for where those hazards are in your area of interest. So I'm gonna click on flood hazards. And again, this starts out um, at the national level, but it lets you zoom in and pick a location. So I'm gonna choose Florida, and then this time I'm gonna choose Pinellas County where I, where I live now. All right, so it zooms you in to that county level, but again, you can zoom in as far as you would like. Um, 
for those of you that are familiar with St. Pete, you can see the, the pier area here. Um, and I'm, I'll zoom back out just a little bit so you can see some of the, the Tampa area too. Um, so what we're looking at right now is the coastal flood hazard composite. And with any of these layers, if you want to know what you're looking at, you can just press the little information button and it shows what we see. So this shows shallow coastal flooding, those areas that are impacted you know, during a, a king tide type event. It shows high and moderate risk flooding designated by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So that's your 100-year flood and your 500-year flood. Um, it also show, shows storm surge for categories one through three um, and then sea level rise information. So this is really a, a composite um, and sort of a you know worst case um, of all the different flooding risks at once. If you want to know about a particular area, you can zoom in and click on a particular area and it'll tell you the specific flooding risks for that area. That's just a, a nice feature. Also for any of these maps, you can change your base map over to a satellite view. I'll do that. Um, just so you can see it that way. Um, and also you can put on a legend. And so this just tells you again what you're seeing on this map. You might not want to look at all of this at once and you might want to tease out um, the different flooding hazards. So I'll turn on storm surge, for example. And again, this information is from the slosh model. Um, again, you've got your legend showing you uh, red is uh, areas that would be impacted in a category one. And then you can see if you get into the yellow, those are areas that would only be impacted if we had a, a really big storm, a, a category five storm surge. Sea level rise is one of the layers in here. This uses the same data from the sea level rise viewer and just pulls it up in here. Um, I want to say a note about all of the data in this tool. It's all accessible if you want to download it. Uh, the tool itself is designed to be used by folks that don't have GIS expertise. Um, but if you do want to grab the map services and use the data in your own GIS systems or tools, you can easily do that. Down here on the left, there's a button for data sources. This will let you know where all the data comes from throughout the whole tool. And then there's instructions over here on the right-hand side about exactly how you can grab one of the layers. So say you wanted to grab the sea level rise layer or you wanted to grab the storm surge layer. This tells you how to, how to do that. And then this button right here that says map services actually takes you to that data that you can download. So as I mentioned, one of the features about this tool that has been the most popular is that you can share and save maps. So I'm going to be doing that as we go along and then at the end we'll have sort of a, a small library of, of maps that we've collected. So for this map, I'll click on the save this map button and so that will take this view showing sea level rise and, and stick that in my little library. So once you've thought about what are the different flooding hazards for my area, the next thing we might think about is those exposures I talked about. And so I'll start out with societal exposure. And so in this portion of the tool, we have data layers showing population density, poverty, uh, elderly population, number of employees, and then projected population growth. Um, and each of these layers, you can then overlay one or more of your flood hazards. So for example, right now we're looking at population density and our legend shows what the different colors mean in terms of number of people per square mile. And we might overlay that with existing shallow coastal flooding. So if we have a, a king tide event or a really high tide and a, a big rain event, um, these areas in red are some of the, the places that might be impacted and you can think about where you might have a, a heavy population area that's being impacted. 
Here's just another a different underlying data layer. This shows information about the percent below the poverty line. And again, you can think of about that data in combination with different flooding risks. So I might want to save this map. So I'll click Save This Map, put that in our library. I'll just show one more of these data layers. This is the employee information, shows you number of employees. Um, and again, you can overlay it. Say we might overlay that one with storm surge. Um, and again, I'll, I'll save that map in our little library. All right, in addition to societal exposure, another thing um, that's really important for communities to be thinking about is their infrastructure. And in this part of the tool, we have a few different layers. The first is just showing development. Um, and it shows you know, low, medium, and, and high intensity development areas. And again, you can overlay that with, say, sea level rise um, and think about the impacts from sea level rise. Another layer in here, I'll turn off all of our, our flood hazards um, for the moment, is critical facilities. Um, and this is not a comprehensive set of critical facilities, as you'll, you'll quickly realize, um, but these are the ones that we can access nationally. Critical facility data is protected um, by the Department of Homeland Security, so it's, it's not something you can get for every facility. But this does show you fire stations or EMS stations, hospitals, uh, law enforcement, and schools. Um, and again, this is something where you can pull in um, the FEMA flood zones, for example, the 100-year and 500-year, and think about, you know, if we had a 100-year event or a 500-year event, which of those critical facilities might be impacted? And again, I'll just save that map. And then the last piece under infrastructure is looking at development patterns. Turn off our flood here and switch over to development patterns. Um, and this just shows the areas that have been recently developed. Um, Pinellas is, is pretty developed already, um, but there are some areas where you'll see really big changes. This is between 1990 and, and 2011. Um, but another way to think about, you know, where is development growing in our area? And then what are, you know, what does that mean in terms of where we expect future flooding because of sea level rise? All right, I'm going to save that map too. And then the last piece of this tool is the ecosystem exposure component. And this has information about existing natural areas and open space um, that can help think about areas that might be buffers or able to absorb coastal flooding. Um, it also has a layer in here about potential pollution sources. And you can see over here that this shows you brownfield properties, hazardous waste sites, Superfund sites, things like that. Um, and then you can overlay it with shallow coastal flooding or the FEMA flood zones to think about how some of those um, pollution sources might be impacted and might cause a problem in the event of a storm. We'll save that map as well. All right, so we've been going along and looking at different exposures from different flood hazards, and we've been saving these, those maps. And now I'm going to look at what we have in our library. And so, and you can check on this at any time. You can go to the collect button and have a look in what's there, and then go back and make some more maps. Um, but when you go to your library, you'll see those maps that you generated, and you can print them um, right from this page and then or save them as a, a PDF and then there's also URLs links for each individual map and you can copy those links and send them to a colleague and they can pop in the link and, and look at that map um, so this is just a really great tool for for continuing to share the maps when you do close out from the tool your library is not saved so if you want to go back to a map it's important that you do save that URL or email it to yourself so you have them um, but this ability to print out the maps and um, pop them into presentations and, and email them to others is one of the things that people really like about the tool. I want to wrap it up here quickly. I'll just mention there are some tips about how to use the, the different maps and how you might apply those in, in planning processes. 
there's some follow-on resources with more background and some case studies um, that you can check out how different communities are doing resilience planning processes that use this type of, of information. All right, and I'm going to actually turn back for one minute before I wrap it up um, to the slides because I want to mention a project um, last year, the Department of Economic Opportunity and the Regional Planning Councils got a small grant from the Florida Coastal Management Program to do a project related to coastal flooding hazards. And the idea was that all the Regional Planning Councils would learn about some tools for, visualization, for visualizing inundation risk and assessing vulnerabilities. And then the councils would pair up. And for each pair, one council applied one or more of the tools to assess vulnerability somewhere in their region. And then the other council held a workshop to train up interested folks in the region. And the two tools that I just demonstrated, as well as the tool that Krista will be sharing with you, were part of this project. And that means that the regional planning councils are a great resource for anyone who might want to use the tools um, since they already have some experience with them. And some of you on the line today may well have attended one of the workshops. Um, there were five of those workshops held around the state um, in the last few months. All right, and with that, I'm going to ask Lindsay if she doesn't mind queuing up the next poll question to ask about the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper and whether that's a tool that you all have used or think you might use. Sure thing. I am going to go ahead and launch the poll right now. You should be able to respond to the poll. And we've also got a few questions. So while we're getting the poll uh, responses back. Uh, the first question is, um, I noticed in both mappers there's not data for Alaska. Alaska has more coastline than the continental U.S. combined. Is there any intent for data um, for Alaska to be added? Yeah, great question. So both of these viewers rely on elevation data um, and LIDAR is the technology for gathering that data and unfortunately there just isn't LIDAR data for Alaska and so that's why Alaska is not in these tools right now. Um, there's definitely interest in getting Alaska that data and getting them added to these tools. Um, but that will require some funding. It would be a, a big effort to collect that LIDAR for the whole state. Okay, I'm going to do a combined question and then um, we're going to turn it over to Crystal um, just in the interest of time and then we can always loop back to more questions uh, at the end of the um, final tool presentation. So just the final question is, um, can the viewer adjust the transparency of layers and can it also produce a report of the number of features within the overlay areas? And I'm also going to go ahead and close the poll. Okay, thanks. So yes to the transparency, right under where you select the flood hazard, you can um, make it more or less transparent so you can see what's underneath better. I should have done that, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, I don't think that there's a way to query and get the number of schools, for example, that, that would be impacted in a 100-year flood. Um, but if you download the data and add it you know, to an existing GIS, that's something that the state of New Jersey did, is they took the data and added it to their own local data. Um, and then they can query you know, how, how many um, schools or fire stations um, would be impacted by that. So there isn't a way to do that query within the tool but you can add the data to a, a GIS system and query it that way. Okay, great. As far as the poll results go, 26% um, of the respondents say they definitely plan to use the tool, 35% are likely to use, 35% may use the tool in the future, 2% are unlikely to use, and 2% have already used this tool, and 78% of you responded. And so with that, um, I think we're going to turn it over to Crystal Goodison to present the final tool. All right. I've just made Crystal the presenter, so Crystal, you should see it pop up asking you to take charge. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. We can see it in Tallahassee, yes. Okay, great. 
Thank you all. Thank you, Heidi, for that excellent presentation. Um, Crystal Goodison from the Geoplan Center, and today I will be talking about a mapping tool that we developed uh, for the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, quickly, a little roadmap, um, I'll give a little background on our tool, um, and then give you a quick demo of our current map viewer, which is publicly available. And then I'm going to squeeze in a sneak peek of our next generation map viewer, because it has some new features that I'm excited to show. So the, the purpose and intent of the sea level scenario sketch planning tool is really as a starting place to assess the impacts of sea level rise on the transportation system. So the tool maps where and when sea level rise is projected to occur in Florida and the potential transportation impacts. Um, it uses local tide gauge data from NOAA to show regional projections of sea level rise and really the tool is meant to be used as a planning level tool for quick assessment of potential transportation impacts under various scenarios of sea level rise. So a little bit of background, um, you know, Florida has been called ground zero for the implications of sea level rise because we've got so many low-lying coastal communities, uh, we've got lots of people and property and infrastructure at risk. Uh, sea level rise in Florida, um, sea levels have already risen about eight inches over the past century in Florida, and um, that rate of sea level rise has been increasing over the past few decades. Uh, Common future scenarios of sea level rise uh, range from about half a foot of sea level rise to over six feet of sea level rise um, by the end of 2100. So with that huge range, um, it leaves you wondering, you know, how do I start planning for sea level rise? Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation, uh, probably six or seven years ago, uh, started building some university partnerships to figure out well, if the department should want to start assessing the impacts of sea level rise on the transportation network, well, what projections should they use? What methods should they use? There's certainly a lot of sea level rise projections out there. So they first partnered with Florida Atlantic University, who um, came back with a great comprehensive report um, of the different projections being used, and they recommended that the department look at what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was doing to not only map regional sea level rise, but also to how to project and plan for it. And then further, they also recommended that the department develop some type of planning tool to help identify uh, which transportation infrastructure would be potentially vulnerable to sea level rise. And those recommendations really became the basis of our work, the Geoplan Center's work with the department. Um, they approached us to specifically implement um, these recommendations from FAU. Uh, the Geoplan Center has been working for quite a number of years, almost two decades, with the Department of Transportation, helping them with GIS and mapping data and decision support tools tools for environmental permitting. So the, the tool, this, the sketch planning tool, uh, was, that name was really coined in the FAU report, um, is really a work in progress. Um, we've been working on it over a number of phases. Uh, the first phase, we did the regional sea level rise maps. Um, we focused specifically on sea level rise only, uh, developing the maps, doing the transportation analyses of what would be at risk, and developing the visualization tools. And in phase two, we worked with um, different federal highway climate resiliency pilots to test out what we've created, figure out how we could make it better. And then in phase three, which is currently in progress, we are, we're working on implementing um, some of the feedback we got on phase two. Um, and so we're, we're shifting towards not just looking at sea level rise only, but looking at multiple flood risks and we're also doing some major upgrades to our map viewer and adding in um, some of the NOAA sea level rise projection curves in addition to the Army Corps of Engineers curves. So what I'm going to show you today will be um, what was already developed and what is, is currently pending. So the sea level scenario sketch planning tool is really a set of tools, uh, three specific tools. One is a map viewer um, that helps you visualize areas of um, sea level rise inundation and affected infrastructure. Um, and this is a tool that's meant for people that don't have GIS expertise, uh, you just need a web browser and internet connection to take a look at what the impacts would look like in your area. Um, if you want to drill down further, we offer the GIS data layers uh, for download on our website so you could play around with that and do your own overlays. And then finally, we offer an ArcGIS add-in, the Sea Level Rise Inundation Surface Calculator, which allows you to create um, custom inundation layers um, if you have 
um, more higher resolution elevation data and specific needs. But that does require GIS software and expertise. So first I want to go ahead and show you, you switch over to the map viewer. This here um, is our website, and, and like Heidi said, don't worry about writing it down. It's, it's in one of the handouts, but our map viewer has um, the data that's available for download, um, the tool, the ArcGIS tool I just mentioned, and it also um, has um, map viewers available, which is what I'm going to show you. If you go to the View Interactive Maps page, um, you'll see this image of Florida. Our map viewers uh, for this uh, version one of the sketch tool has um, the map viewers broken out by Florida Department of Transportation districts. Um, and our new map viewer will be migrating away from that. Um, I've already got um, District 7 loaded up like Heidi. We did a pilot project um, for this area, so it's one of my, my favorite demo areas as well. So when you go to the map viewer, um, for District 7. This is the default view um, that you'll see. I'm going to go ahead and change my base map as well in the, the upper right corner um, to imagery with labels so you get a little better sense of where you're at. And I'm going to as well zoom into St. Pete. And one of the first things um, that I like to do is, is get a sense of what the sea level rise will look like in this area, similar to what Heidi showed you stepping through the one to six feet of sea level rise. We've got a time lapse viewer um, that sort of steps you through sea level rise over time. So I'm going to choose the high projection, the Army Corps of Engineers high projection, and hit play. And it's essentially going to walk you through what the sea level rise scenarios, the high projections will look like. So at 2020, no inundation, 2040, 2060, 2080, and then 2100 obviously looks very dramatic. If you zoom in, it'll, it will continue to play. But this will give you a good overall sense of the areas that would be impacted. So I'm going to zoom in here. I'm going to close this. And on the left-hand side, show you some of the map layers that are available in this viewer. So right now, we have built in basically 12 different scenarios of future sea level rise. We have chosen 2040, 2060, 2080, and 2100. For each one of those time periods, we have three different um, projections, a high, a medium, and a low. So you can think of it as the worst case scenario, medium case, and basically the, the low projection is just the historic rate of sea level rise, not taking into any other accelerating factors of sea level rise. So we'll go ahead and look at uh, 2040. We'll look at the high projection. When you open up um, this folder, you'll see two additional folders, um, and it's basically mapping the sea level rise on top of either mean sea level or mean higher high water. I'm going to look at mean higher high water. That is your observed high tide. And if I scroll down and open this folder, you'll see a number of transportation layers that we've analyzed for um, impacts under this scenario. I'm going to go ahead and turn on this RCI. It's the Road Characteristics Inventory uh, for the Department. That's the Department of Transportation's database. And as I turn that on, you can see some of these red segments popping up. And those are um, roadway segments that would be affected under this scenario of sea level rise, which is 2040, the high projection. I'll go ahead and zoom in, get a sense of what this looks like. I can go ahead and add, I'm going to drill down um, into this segment uh, by clicking on uh, this table icon up here, which is called View Attributes of Affected Infrastructure. And what this is doing, it's basically loading the attribute information that's associated with the spatial layer. Um, it sometimes takes a minute to load because it's dynamically loading what is in the viewer. As you see this table pop up, um, you get some attributes, some information. Um, you know, this is San Martin Boulevard. Um, this entire segment is about a mile and a half. Out of that mile and a half segment, about a quarter of a mile is inundated. You'll see at the very, on the far right, there's a miles inundated field. And that'll show you the, um, the miles inundated under this scenario. If we zoom out, you'll see the table sort of reload and it'll be adding basically 
additional affected segments that are in the map viewer. So the, the table is connected to, to, the, to the map view. If you wanted, if you were interested in a particular area and you wanted, you could zoom to a, an area, get the attribute table and export it um, to a comma separated file which you could bring into Excel. Of course, it's, it's hanging on me because I'm doing a live demo. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this out and show you another feature. If you zoom back in, we've got a little Google Street View Man that will allow you to sort of look at the conditions of that roadway. If you pop them up here, here you'll see, you can see the conditions of the roadway. Um, in this little window that opens up, you can see down here that the, the image date here is August 2016. This is using Google Street View to get a sense of what that roadway looks like. And yes, there's not much of a swale, so this could be an area of concern. Close this guy out. Additionally, um, you can look at the some of the other 12 scenarios that are in here and poke around and drill down into the data. If you um, find an area of concern and would like to make a map, there's also a feature uh, to make a map. You can hit this print button in the top of your map. You can name your map and choose a couple different features. I'll choose to make it landscape and hit print. I've already printed the map just to um, avoid a server lag, but this is essentially what you would see when you print that map out. It'll give you a nicely formatted map with a legend and a scale bar, and you can take that and use it similar to Coastal Flood Ex Exposure Mapper. So that is the basics of what I wanted to show here. I've only got a couple more minutes. I wanted to shift over and show you um, a little preview of what we're developing for our, our version 2 viewer. Okay, so this here is our, our, our viewer that is in development. Uh, we're zoomed into Volusia and Brevard um, because we just did a pilot project with them and we have data, new data available in, in the tool. What you'll see over here um, on the left is what we call our scenario selector. It allows you to choose a sea level rise scenario. Um, I've only got data for Volusia and Brevard loaded in here, so I'm going to choose Volusia. I'm going to look at the high projection. I'll look at 2040. We don't have all the decades in now, and I'm going to look at it on top of mean high or high water. When I hit show scenario, it'll turn on um, that scenario, and what you'll see, these areas in dark blue are the areas of sea level rise inundation um, at this uh, scenario, and the red segments are the segments um, the roadway segments that are affected. Now one thing that is different um, between our old viewer and our new viewer is that this new viewer will basically, it takes the entire segment that's affected and um, brings it into the layer and brings it onto the map instead of just showing the little pieces that are in in intersected by the flooding. Because we think uh, a better approach would be to look at the entire roadway segment and what that roadway segment is connecting to. So if I click on um, this particular segment, I can pull up some attribute information. Uh, we know this is Turn Bay Boulevard. It's about a five-mile segment of roadway. Um, it's a major collector, got the average daily traffic numbers in there. We know that it is not an evacuation route. And then we can also see, forgive me, this is not formatted for public consumption yet, but we can see that there's about almost 300 feet of that roadway that would be affected under the sea level rise scenario. That's only about 1% of the roadway, so maybe not too much of a concern right now. Then I'm going to switch over. If we want to look at another scenario sea level rise, so this one was 2040, the high projection. Um, if we want to go ahead and look at 2070, can show that scenario and load that in there. Oh, of course, I got a little error. Try it again. Oh, that's what happens when you have a demo. We'll try to load another one. There we go. We'll load 2100. Things get a little bit more dramatic. And one of the fun features that we've got in here, one of the things that we wanted to build in was the ability to um, 
really compare scenarios. So I'm going to go ahead and move this down, this layer down. You can reorder the, um, the layers in here, and you can also change the transparency if you'd like. And what I want to show here is the ability to swipe in between these scenarios. I'm going to swipe from the higher level uh, of sea level rise. This is five feet of sea level rise. And what, what you see now is that what's on the right side of my screen is this 2040 high scenario about over a foot of sea level rise. And what I'm going to swipe in is essentially the five feet of sea level rise. And what I'm looking for is particular roadway segments that might pop up that were not um, at risk before that are starting to become risk at risk. And so what this allows you to do is look at the changes over time, what might pop up. I'm going to zoom in up here so you get a better view. You can see some of these segments popping up and some additional areas popping up. I'm going to take a look at I'm going to exit out of that tool and take a look at this segment in particular. Oops. We can see that this segment is Main Street. It's about three miles long. Um, minor collector with, with not much um, average daily traffic. However, we can see it is an evacuation route. And under this scenario of sea level rise, um, it's got, this is in feet, so over a mile of um, affected um, flooding and almost 44% of that roadway would be affected under that um, scenario of sea level rise. So if we zoom in a little closer, we can also do a street view on this. We can right click it and do a street view. That street view is going to load down here, but I can undock it and pull it onto the map and take a look and see, okay, this roadway is very close to the water can already see some stabilization that's been going on. So this would probably be a roadway, since it is an evacuation route, um, a roadway that you might want to take a closer look at. Close that up. Another feature um, I wanted to show you is just this the simple print. Similar to the other one, you can, you can name this Main Street and choose your format and then choose whether you want it landscape or portrait and hit print. Um, again, I've already created this one just to show you all what it'll look like, but these maps are available. You can download them and save them for your own use. Um, one important thing I want to, I know I got to close out, um, I've only got a minute left. Um, one important um, feature that I, or concept that I wanted to show you all with this, our new viewer is, is basically a move towards looking at multiple flood risks. So sort of similar to how the NOAA sea level rise viewer just focused on sea level rise and then you saw uh, the great work with the coastal flood exposure mapper, we are also transitioning from looking at just sea level rise to looking at multiple flood risks. So it's our intention to um, basically add in for all of these road segments, you know, is this road segment affected under these various scenarios of sea level rise, but is it also in a current flood prone area, like 100 year flood plain, 500 year flood plain? We've um, baked in a few of these analyses on the left, current flood risk, and already analyzed some of these uh, roadways for their current risk uh, of flooding. Um, storm surge and flood plains, and then we're going to add in future flood risk and basically develop an index so you could see for any particular roadway. I know I'm about out of time and I've got more that I want to show you, uh, but I just wanted to end by saying uh, the sketch tool, why and how would you use it? Um, just to name a few, um, a few uses, you could evaluate regional sea level rise scenarios and impacts to transportation over time, sort of identify this broad timeline and try to figure out these tipping points. When do things get really bad? Um, hopefully match the, the timing of impacts with your planning horizons and prioritize your um, infrastructure investments. Engage the community in discussion, um, analyze evacuation routes uh, for flooding, and you can also use the base layers for community vulnerability assessments. Um, you should not use it for site-specific analyses or site design. It's not specific to a year. Our projections are, are by decade. It's not to be used for stormwater drainage, doesn't include um, impacts on groundwater, and it's not to be used for property assessment.
So I know I'm about out of time. I'm going to wrap it up there and I guess take questions if we have questions and then also ask um, Lindsay to do the poll as well. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, I am about to go live with the third poll. Um, if you all can just take a couple of minutes and respond to the poll really quickly, I'll jump into some questions um, and I'm going to work my way um, back starting with this uh, sea level sketch planning tool. Um, the question is, as many of us work along with FEMA to update coastal flood insurance rate maps, is the output to the level it may be used by local communities to use to identify proposed conditions? Um, and to clarify, proposed conditions would be used within local codes, um, for example, building, freeboard requirements greater than that identified within the Florida Building Code. Was that a question for me or for Heidi? Um, it's not clear. It looks like it's for you, Crystal. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and respond. I, I would say this is more of a, a screening level tool um, to try to narrow down um, which facilities need to be taken a look at. I would recommend on-site um, ground truthing and verification um, to really do that level of regulation. But there are um, certainly a lot of these things that, that we're doing, that NOAA is doing, other communities are doing, can be used. Um, uh, to, for points in the community rating systems. There are a lot of tools that can be used and benefited, uh, but I don't, I would say that you, you would need ground truthing for site level. Okay. Uh, we do have a few more questions, but I do want to just note that we're about at the one o'clock hour, so I understand if folks need to uh, drop off of the call, but it's my intent for us to stay on for about another five minutes or so to finish up the poll and to get to some of these questions. Um, but for those of you that aren't able to stay, again, you'll be able to access this webinar um, within the next few days to a week on the APA Florida Emerging Topics website. And thank you for joining us. But I'm going to just jump back to the questions. And I believe this is a question for Crystal. Um, what is the year of the data, the demographic, economic, land cover, et cetera? Oh, that was probably for Heidi because we don't okay. necessarily have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just say that it, it will vary, but for each of the data layers, you can pull up that data source information um, and find out, you know, what year it's from, but it's the most, whatever is most recently available um, from census or, or whatever the source is. Okay. Another question is, do you expect the availability of these tools to continue under the Trump administration? I'll start. This is Heidi, and I would say yes, definitely. Um, coastal flooding uh, risks are things that coastal communities are facing now and, and really want help with, um, and we want to continue to to provide assistance and help. So yes, I think these tools will be available. Okay. Um, and I believe this question is for Heidi. Does the data use have the ability to assume a hardened coastline? So no. What you see in the tools is based on current coastlines. So whether if, if it's currently hardened, you know, it assumes that, um, but if it's currently natural shoreline, it, it assumes that and that the water would come in um, based on those different types of shoreline. It doesn't have the ability to say, okay, what happens if we seawall the whole, the whole coast? It's not designed for that. It's just under, under our current development patterns um, and existing natural areas, where would inundation go? Okay. The next question is, is there an attribute table associated with the maps? If, sh if so, can you show one? I believe this is for Heidi on, um, on the coast, coastal flood exposure mapper. Yeah, and I, there isn't an attribute table. There's just the, the legend that I showed, and then there's the information tab where you can see what that data layer is showing. Um, so for like pollution sources that shows you, you know, that that shows you brownfield areas, um, Superfund sites, et cetera, 
it's not in the form of a table as you might get in a GIS. If you were to get the map services and take that data and put it into ArcGIS, um, then you could get an attribute table. Does that okay. make sense, I hope? <laughs> Um, if it doesn't make sense, um, the um, question author can certainly type another question in for clarification. Okay, great. okay final two questions, and um, they came uh, from the same person. Are there any finer gradations than the foot, and I believe this is for the coastal flood exposure mapper tool, a uh, foot of sea level increase will be tough for the public to anticipate as, as a pressing concern. And then the second question is, what is the datum for sea level depicted in these tools? Does it reflect sea level as currently inundates Miami Beach, or is the sea level based on earlier mean sea levels? So the current datum is current mean higher high water. So if there's two tides in Miami Beach, it's the extent of the water during the highest of the two high tides. Um, that's what it starts out with. And the first part of the question is no, within the tool, you can't look at, like, say, half a foot of sea level rise. I think that if you download the underlying data, you can map that for yourself, but I'm not 100% about that. Um, but I think if you download the, the underlying data, it has the, the LIDAR, and you, you could look at at half a foot. Crystal might actually know the answer to that because she's got more technical expertise on the back end. Do you know, Crystal? Come again. She said the, the, the second part of the question, so I was still thinking about the first part of your question. Um, um, yeah, the second part of the question was, what is the datum for sea level depicted in these tools? Does it reflect sea level as currently inundates Miami Beach, or is the sea level based on earlier mean sea levels? Oh, so for that that portion of the question, it's the same answer as Heidi's. It's the current um, mean sea level and current um, mean higher high water. Um, but I think, Heidi, did you have another part of your question? The first part of the question was if you wanted to see half a foot of okay. sea level rise. Is that in yeah. the underlying data? Yes. So yeah. if you if you wanted to map that, so, and sorry, I was lost in thought for a second. Um, yeah, and, and that's something that you could do with our sea level rise inundation calculator. You basically can put in um, your own elevation data, and the current LIDAR data sets for Florida go down to about um, a meet, like, just about, I'd say like two meters is probably the lowest you could go. In some areas, a five foot um, pixel resolution. And so you could map, um, you could map half a foot. Um, I probably, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it because of the, um, the vertical um, error margins on those. Uh, but you can certainly do it with the disclaimer that, you know, it's plus or minus a certain error margin. But using our um, calculator, you could, you know, plug in your own elevation data set and, and put in the amount of sea level rise, half a foot. So hopefully that explains that. Okay, great. Well, um, we don't have any more questions, but I do want to report back on the poll for the, the final tool, the sea level scenario sketch planning tool. Um, of the 90% of participants who voted, 25% definitely plan to use. 25% are likely to use, 45% may use in the future, 5% are unlikely to use, and 0% are reporting to have already used the tool. So with that, um, and on behalf of the Emerging Topics Committee in APA Florida, I want to extend a sincere thank you to Heidi Stiller and Crystal Goodison for joining us today. This information has been very interesting and hopefully will be useful um, in the future as we do our planning work and coastal resiliency work across the state. And I also want to thank um, you, the attendees, for joining us in today's webinar. Again, this presentation is going to be available on the APA Florida website. And APA Florida will be sending you a follow-up questionnaire to obtain your feedback about this webinar. Please take a couple of minutes to provide us your feedback. This questionnaire is also going to include some questions from Heidi and Crystal, and it would be really helpful to get your response because they're seeking to learn about whether or not these tools are going to be useful to you as a practitioner and 
may help them develop additional um, versions or additional tools in the future. So please do respond when you receive that email. We're just looking as, as, um, for ways to better serve you, our APA Florida members, uh, in future webinars and continuing education programming as well. So with that, I'm going to wish you a happy new year once again, and I hope you have a really great day. Thank you so much.